Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you can take your seats, please. Okay, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. If you can take your seats, please. Uh, welcome to Automotive Logistics Global 2017. And having asked you all to sit down, the first thing I'm going to ask you to do now is can you please all stand up? And I just want you to introduce yourselves to whoever's sitting on either side of you. <laughs> okay, I said introduce yourselves, not do a full sales pitch to them. Okay, and why did I do that? Because in a way, that's what this conference is all about. Uh, I wanted to kind of take you a little bit out of your comfort zone, which is how we need to be preparing for the sessions. And also our conference is very much about networking and interacting, so we wanted to get that started right from the beginning. And on that note, I suppose I'd better introduce myself. My name's Louis Yakumi, and 20 years ago this month, I launched the first issue of Automotive Logistics magazine. And 20 years later, I've still got the same job. Sad, isn't it? No, but seriously, now uh, I'm now the, the group publisher of, of Automotive Logistics, the publishers of Automotive Logistics and Finnish Vehicle Logistics magazines and the organizers of the Automotive Logistics Global Series of Conferences that are now held in Mexico, China, UK, Brazil, Russia, India, Europe, and of course here in the United States of America. Also on the subject of globalization, I'd just like to, to say that everyone at Automotive Logistics, and I'm sure the whole audience here, uh, would just like to take a, a few minutes to uh, to think about the victims of the terrible storms and hurricanes that have happened around, uh, around the United, in and around the United States. And also to think of our Mexican friends who suffered a terrible earthquake yesterday. But we're back in Detroit, uh, and I'm delighted to be back here. It's still the home of the global automotive industry and looks like it will be for a few years to come, although there's, things are changing. It's an exciting time in the automotive industry. And we've all heard how much the automotive industry is going to change in the next 10, ten years, but what does that mean for us? What do we, what do you have to do differently? As our conference theme reflects, it's time to start designing tomorrow's supply chains today. And these supply chains have to be smart, high-tech, and innovative. It's also obvious that the next wave of automotive logistics cannot be done by one individual or company alone, but we'll, be, we'll need the industry to work together. So over the next couple of days, you will hear from car makers, part suppliers, LSPs, uh, and also from outsiders to the automotive industry to hear what can be done to make sure that, automotive of, that the automotive logistics of the future is ready to support the automotive industry of the future. Amongst the, the forward-looking innovative companies are our sponsors. Our premier sponsor and premier sponsors of every automotive logistics conference since our first back in Chicago in the year 2000, uh, Ryder. So I'd like to thank Ryder for your continued support for our conference over the years. Thank you very much. Our very first innovation sponsor, Sergier who really encourage innovation in the automotive logistics sector, not only by what they do, but how they really push uh, to have more discussion and focus on, on innovation. 
Our gold sponsors, Accelerated Services, Air Charter Service, CNW, DHL, DSV, Evolution Time Critical, in 4 gt Nexus, Hub Group, who hosted the, the great cocktail reception last night, Jack Cooper, JDA Software, Landstar, Metro Supply Chain Group, Penske, Protrans, RJ and Sons, Syncrean and XPO Logistics. Our global sponsors, Changju Logistics, CDC, and Jeffco, so-called because they sponsor all of our conferences around the world. And our silver sponsors, Forflow, APL Logistics, CHEP, Geodis, Inform, Orbis, Proact, Royale International, and Schnellica Logistics. They all have products, knowledge, and people to support your industry. So read their literature, meet their people, and make sure you visit the exhibition stand area, not just for the coffee and the cookies, but there's some really fun stands and a lot of things going on around, around the room. Robots, ro robots roaming around and so on. RJ and Sons have put some charging stations up there as well uh, in case your bat battery runs out while you're playing Angry Birds during the sessions and things like that. You may have noticed that there's no printed program this year. That's because I don't know what's going to be happening over the next two days. No, it's because we've launched a new app, an Automotive Logistics Live app, which you can download uh, on your smartphone or tablet from the Apple uh, iStore or from Google Play, I think it is, for Android. There's details on the screen there. So if you need the, uh, if you need the Wi-Fi, which is hosted by Protrans, uh, you can go onto the Wi-Fi. Uh, the network is Global17 and the password Protrans. Uh, but definitely don't download the app. That's how you will see what's happening, what the next sessions are, where they're going to be, who the speakers are in those sessions, and that's also where you can post questions that I'll see as the moderator on stage. You can make comments that, that others can see as well. Uh, you, can, um, you can see the biogs and, uh, uh, and photos of, and more details on the speakers and on the sponsors. Our voting surveys will be done via the app. You can make notes on the app. You can even send direct messages to other attendees on the app. So it's a very simple thing to, to download. Just download it, Automotive Logistics Live, on whichever app store you use. Uh, and, and it really will help you to get the most out of the, out of the whole event and be a real part of it. But most importantly is what you do in the room. Our conferences aren't lectures. They're interactive with questions and opinions uh, in all the sessions. And if the noise during the cocktail receptions is anything to go by, I'm sure this interaction and networking will, con will continue uh, over, the, over the next couple of days. We'll also be using the app and iPads for your uh, opinions on the whole conference and on individual sessions. Uh, we won't be using the, the paper evaluation form, so as always, your opinions are very important to us, so please make sure you use the app um, or one of the iPads scattered around the, uh, around the venue uh, to give us your opinion on individual sessions and also on the conference as a, as a whole. We've got a great two days ahead uh, with uh, really forward-looking sessions. We've moved our very popular automotive logistic think tanks to day one, so they'll be after lunch uh, in, the, in this room. Uh, we're also uh, aiming to encourage the next generation of automotive logisticians so we'll be having, a, uh, for the second year uh, running, we'll have our Automotive Logistics Students Forum where we, bring, where we invite about 50 uh, students, supply chain students and other students uh, from local universities where we can network with them uh, and a couple of people make some points to them about why the automotive industry is still a great industry to be in. So please make sure you're either in the think tanks uh, uh, or, or join us for the... Uh, for the student forum as well. We've got an amazing gala dinner tonight at the Detroit Institute of Arts. And I can tell looking around that we've got a great group of artists amongst us here in logistics. And then we have the Serge Afterglow party. I mean, the, the business networking event, uh, which will be, uh, which will be uh, uh, after, the, after the gala dinner tonight. And don't think about leaving early tomorrow because we've got some great sessions tomorrow. Uh, one on uh, game changers, uh, special panel discussions on finished vehicle logistics and uh, part supplies, and then the final roundup where we bring some of the VIPs together to talk about what innovation means to senior leaders in, in your industry. Uh, you'll also see the red and green cards on the table. 
Those are for kind of snap poles. So uh, maybe we'll do a quick snap poll now just to make sure you understand how to hold up a sheet of paper uh, and how, and I apologize to the colorblind amongst you. Wow, I'm looking at most of your dress. I think there's a lot of you who are colorblind. Um, but, uh, but the question I'd last, like to ask is, um, does the automotive logistics industry require more innovation? Should we be more open-minded for new ideas? So if you can raise your cards, green is, yes, we need to be more innovative. Red, we're doing okay as we are. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. I forgot to mention that I'm colorblind, so all I saw was a load of gray cards up there. Uh, no, the vote was overwhelmingly yes, that we would like to encourage, develop more innovation. And as we said, that, that is the point uh, of the conference. So please be ready for two great days. Uh, be ready to share ideas, build contacts, uh, to learn a little bit maybe. And I'm not sure I need to say this to you guys, but, but I'll say it anyway. And let's, let's try and have a little, a little fun over the next two days as well, but not too much. And now, um, onto, the, onto the first session of the day. What I wanted for the, for, the, for the beginning of the conference, I wanted someone who's going to be, you know, someone who really understands logistics. Uh, someone who's been through, you know, tough times. Someone who's uh, a great athlete. And someone who be, would be really inspirational to start off the conference. And now that I've done that, I'd like to welcome our first speaker of Automotive uh, Logistics Global. You'll know Mike Silvio as the, as the logistician, uh, someone who's worked at various uh, automotive logistics companies over the years, uh, and now as an innovation officer at, uh, at Sergier. But what we're here to, to understand today is the recent, it, the more life lessons from Mike Silvio. And I won't say too much, I'll leave it to Mike uh, to describe what he's done, what he's been through. So I'd like to welcome to the podium, Mike Silvio. Thank you very much, Michael. Thank you, Louis. Wow, well, thank you for having me here. It's really a pleasure to talk about change, and it's unusual to not have to talk about logistics or innovation or digitalization of the supply chain, but something different. Louis asked me to speak about something much more personal. Some of you may know this, some of you may not, but in the past several years, I was fortunate enough to have the experience of running marathons on all seven continents. And uh, an incredible experience that changed me. And there were a number of changes and things that I learned that I want to share with you. But first, to, uh, for the benefit of everybody, uh, that, so I know who's in the audience, could you hold up a green card if you ran a half marathon or a marathon? Any runners in the audience? Quite a few, isn't that great? Now, if you're an ultra marathon runner, could you keep your card up? We've got a couple. Congratulations, these guys are fantastic running ultra marathons. Uh, all of you that are runners know a little bit about what I've gone through to train and to run a marathon. Uh, for those of you that don't know my story, I want to share it with you. Uh, it all started back in 2009 when the recession hit, and we all had to go through a lot of changes. A lot of us lost our jobs. If we were lucky, we just took a pay cut. Remember that, how tough it was in 2009, especially in our industry? I went home to my family, and I said to my wife, okay, we've got two options. You can stop feeding the kids or we can cut our budget back a little bit. And she said, well, you know, we don't have a lot of extra money, a lot of extra budget money to cut. And I said, yes, we do. I'm gonna give up playing golf. I played in two golf leagues. I wasn't very good, so I lost a lot of gambling money. <laughs> and of course, there's a lot of beer and hot dogs involved in when you play two golf leagues. So I gave up golf. I went to the sporting goods store and I bought an $80 pair of running shoes. I was diabetic, I was heavy. It was time for me to get back in shape. I think a lot of us go through that in our 40s. And that's what I did and it turned out that I fell in love with the sport all over again. I ran in high school as a kid and I really fell in love with the sport 
all over again. I love the time I had by myself to think through issues. It relieved stress. It helped me get through some very tough times. But I needed a goal. I'm the kind of person that always performs better when I have something in front of me that I can work towards, that I can look forward to. I needed a goal. So in 2012, I decided to spend the next five years pursuing a single goal of running a marathon on all seven continents. That's a pretty big goal for a 47-year-old diabetic. It's a big goal for a th probably a 30-year-old or a 20-year-old to run uh, that many marathons and travel all over the world doing it. Currently, there are 634 runners registered with the Seven Continent Club of having done it. So not a lot of people have done it, and back then, that number was around 350. So it wasn't like I could contact a lot of people for advice on how to do it, how to train, how to prepare, but I knew how to run a marathon because I had done that. So in my mind, it was doable. Over the past five years that I trained for that, I ran about 7,000 miles. For the, the truckers in the audience, that's enough miles to run to El Paso and back twice. So you log a lot of miles running that many marathons. I embarked on a journey because I thought it was pretty cool. It was a big goal. But what I really took from it was a series of life lessons that changed who I am. So the best way to explain those seven life lessons is really to take you to all seven continents with me. And it'll just take a few minutes to do but to talk just briefly about my race and then what I learned at those races. So the first race that I count towards my seven continents is North America. I ran the Detroit Marathon. There I learned no one will support you like your family and you have to support your family like no one else will. The Detroit Marathon, it, it starts in, a, I think it's in two weeks, and it starts just a few blocks from where we're standing right now. It starts when it's dark, and you reach the Ambassador Bridge crossing into Canada just as the sun rises over the Renaissance Center, and it's a beautiful sight. Maybe tomorrow you'll get up early and walk out and watch that sun rise over Detroit, and it's really, it's, it's dramatic, especially if you're from Detroit and you understand the rebirth of the city. You come back through Canada, you run through the tunnel, the world's only underwater mile, out to Belle Isle, our beautiful park, and then back downtown again. And the thing is about, about running is that it's a lonely sport, and runners love encouragement. And thank heaven my wife and kids are usually on the side of the road. They wait for hours just to high-five me and, and give me that, that little bolt of energy as I cross. But the story really isn't about my wife and kids. It's about my mother. My mother came out early to the race, and she had a sign. And that sign simply said, go Mike, right? Very plain. She came out early, and I found out later she stayed hours after I had passed her. She was waiting at the, uh, at the, the base of the bridge to Belle Isle, where you would cross the bridge to get on the island and cross to get off. So she could see me twice. And later on, I asked her, I said, why did you stay so long after I had run by you the second time? And she responded, you have no idea how many runners are named Mike. <laughs> they, they all thanked her. She was everybody's mother that day. Everybody needs a family to support them. And, and, and you need to be there to support your family in whatever their dreams are. My second continent, South America, I ran Rio de Janeiro. I was fortunate enough to move some meetings around to, to coincide with the marathon, and Rio is just a beautiful city. Maybe you remember seeing some of it from the Olympic Games. Uh, the race that we run in Rio de Janeiro is different than the ones the Olympians run. They run a circle, basically three loops, and it adds up to 26 miles. And, and, and uh, for the public, what they do is they put you on a bus, and they drive you 26.2 miles down the beach. It was at the, the Rio de Janeiro Marathon I learned that you can accomplish more than you think you can. The bus didn't show up, and we were stuck. We were in the city. I think we were in Copacabana Beach. We jumped in a taxi cab and said, take us to the start of the race. Another thing I learned, taxi drivers don't know where races start. <laughs> he dropped us off two miles from the start, 
and 20 minutes after it started, my fastest two miles were the two miles I had to run to get to the race to run 26.2 miles. I started the race with four other people. They were breaking down the, the tents, and we crossed the starting line to get, to get rolling. And we just started counting people. One, two, three, 100, 150, 250. And we caught people and, and made ourselves you know, uh, part of the race. Because when you start alone, you might as well have been on your own long run. And, and we worked so hard to become uh, you know, uh, actual participants, even though we had missed the beginning. We accomplished more than we ever thought we could. None of us had trained for an ultra. None of us had trained to run 28 miles. 26 is a stretch. But we learned that if you really have to dig down deep, you can accomplish more than you think you can. The third marathon, the third continent, was Africa. I learned that everyone has gratitude inside of them. You just have to find yours. I joined 120 other runners on an 86,000 acre wildlife preserve in Kenya. We ran uh, in sight of some of the world's most amazing animals. There were two helicopters overhead scaring away the big game. The night before the race, we were tracking lions, elephants, rhinos, giraffes, on the very trails we woke up and ran. An incredible experience for sure. This was part of a charity run with the Tusk Fund. Uh, it's called Safaricom, and it's the race that Pippa Middleton and Prince Harry all support, and it's one of the tougher African races. What we did was we raised money for a number of different causes that they support, and the two of them I want to talk about is, is the uh, money that we raised for the schools. We visited some schools in Kenya, and we got to see the, the dirt floors, the tin roofs, and each of us brought a duffel bag full of school supplies. Not, and not just the little duffel bag. I'm talking, we all brought the big North Face duffel bags, and when we left, there was a pile of school supplies waist high, so every one of those students could do their schoolwork that year. We also visited a water project where we met women who walked five and six miles to the water project and strapped gallons of water onto the back of their donkeys so they could bring clean water back to their village. And they did it every day. They were incredibly thankful, incredibly thankful for, for that water, and it was amazing to see. Now then I started to think, what am I thankful for? When I got back from Africa, things had changed for me. All of a sudden, I wasn't the crazy guy that said he was going to run seven continents. I became the crazy guy that was definitely going to run seven continents. And that was when my friends got behind me. My coworkers got behind me. What I learned is people will rally around you and help you achieve your goal if you let them know what your goal is. It's important to your friends. It's important to your family. It's important to your coworkers. They will be supportive. And my friends really came through for me. In fact, the September before I ran my final marathon, I was, I was struggling, training was tough, I was burned out, and I had a friend give me a book called What I Talk About When I Talk About Running. And I never really had the chance to tell him, but that book got me through some of the toughest times when I really needed it. Louis, thank you. Appreciate it. In Asia, I learned that it takes a team of professionals to get you to the finish line. Now, it doesn't just apply for running. It applies for everything that we do. I ran Tokyo, an amazing race, one of the majors. Tens of thousands of runners. You run past the very modern parts of Tokyo, and then you run also past the Shinto and Buddha shrines, and just amazing sights. And people lined the streets, just you know, cheering for you and offering encouragement. At least I think they did. I don't speak Japanese. I didn't understand a single word they said, but they were yelling very loud, and, and, that was a, and I was very appreciative of that. It's tradition in Japan that uh, they dress up in costumes for the race. And so from a runner's perspective, some of you might relate to it, there's nothing worse than being beat 
by a Power Ranger or a giant M&M. You always, you always want to beat the giant M&M. So before the race, I had a hip injury. It's not uncommon for injuries to occur, and I've, I've missed a couple races before it. But these kind of races are, are fairly expensive to, to get into. Uh, there's a lot of logistics involved, and so you don't want to miss it. So with this hip injury, I had to bring in uh, coaches and doctors and a masseuse and people that could help me through my training to get me to the starting line so I could finish that race. And it was a struggle. But that team of professionals got me there. My hip was killing me. But it all changed at mile 22. At mile 22, I was about to quit. And I saw on the side of the road another runner dressed in costume, I assume, dressed in costume. He was wearing a loincloth. He was barefoot. His arms were outstretched and he was tied to a wooden cross. He was at the side of the road, and strangers were offering him water and nutrition so he could finish that race. You can't be afraid to ask for the help of others, to ask for their knowledge, for their water, to get to your goal. And I think a little prayer helps too. My next continent was Europe, London. Hometown of many of our friends here. That's where I learned you can be selfish and help others. In fact, you need selfish people. Selfish people produce things, they make things, and they want to help people, right? You want something done, give it to a busy person. In London, I ran through the narrow streets. It was cold and rainy, just like you would expect, and the sights were incredible, running past Big Ben, uh, across the Tower Bridge, and you finish with Buckingham Palace in the background. They do that so they can sell you pictures of you finishing with Buckingham Palace in the background, right? So, um, but I was only in London for 72 hours. I needed to run Europe. I didn't have much time, so I flew in, registered for the race, ran the race, and took the first possible flight home. Uh, to do that, again, you pay a bit of a premium to, uh, to the London Marathon people, uh, the Virgin Money Marathon. That marathon is the single biggest fundraising race in the world. That year they raised 5.2 million pounds to go to a specific trust that uh, helps people, uh, hospitals and, and a number of charities. Running a marathon is incredibly selfish. Those of you that have done it, you know the time that it takes to train, the miles you put in, the time away from your family, the, mi the time away from, from work when you could be doing other things. It's an incredibly selfish endeavor. What I did was seven times as, as, as selfish because I flew around the world and took time away. But it's good to see that people that do incredibly selfish things, like run marathons, like work hard, have the time and put the effort in to help others. And I know all of you do that, and it's really part of our DNA in this country, and I think it's one of the things that make our country great. So you can be selfish and you can help others. That was my fifth continent. My sixth continent was Australia. I ran the Australian Outback Marathon. Dirt and dusty trails, sand dunes, uh, wild camels and kangaroos in the, uh, in the outback you have to keep your eye out for. A land so barren that there were only five porta potties in the entire territory that we could utilize for the race. Most races you go to, there's hundreds. There, there were only five, and the lines were long. I travel with a company called Marathon Tours. And usually I travel as a single, which means they find another single and they match you to a room and it allows you to save money. Usually about $700 per race. That's enough. I can, I can put up with anybody for a weekend or a week or even two weeks. For Australia, I did something different. I learned that you need to create memories that outlive the experience. Most of these races I did by myself, and I came home, and only I had the memories and a few pictures to share with my friends. In Australia, I brought my 15-year-old daughter with me. I thought, ah, I can spend two weeks with my daughter. That shouldn't be too hard. Time zone changes, lack of sleep, there's a lot of crying, a lot of pain, and that was me. My daughter was fine, but I struggled. We created memories 
that will outlive my lifetime. We snorkeled the Great Barrier Reef. We climbed Uluru, or Ayers Rock. Uh, we climbed to the top of the Sydney Bridge and touched the flagpoles at the top of the bridge. We did incredible things. I made her part of my dream. I showed her how to dream. I didn't make my life more interesting. I made her life more interesting. I created a memory for her that will certainly outlive me. So that was a great lesson for me personally. So that was my sixth continent, which leaves one continent left. Probably thought I'd never get to it. Antarctica. Um, Antarctica, I learned a lesson. And this is the one lesson I want all of you to walk away with and, 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 and take with you. We all live in a very high-stress situation, right? You know, where's my material? Where's the solution? Where's the sale? We all have responsibilities that we need to take care of. In Antarctica, I learned you have to listen to your body. Antarctica is considered one of the toughest marathons in the world for good reason. The weather can change in minutes. You never know what the course is going to be like. Freezing temperatures, steep hills, rocks, muck, and 50 mile an hour wind gusts really make it a challenge. The race director promised that it would be the most difficult thing we'd ever done, and it was. He delivered, that's for sure. We ran from the Russian research station to the Chinese research station. Sounds like they're a long ways apart, Russia to China. It's got to be at least 26 miles. It wasn't. It was 2.17 miles of trail that they could clear, and we repeated that run 12 times. 12 times, hills, rocks, muck, that got worse as you ran it over and over again repeatedly. It wasn't just a physical challenge, it became a mental challenge of repetition. The race was a highlight of a two week trip. We spent two and a half days crossing the Drake Passage on a 300 foot research vessel, and uh, we uh, experienced the entire time 30 foot swells. So if you can imagine sailing through water where the swells were, uh, this ceiling seems to be about 30 feet, it's rough waters. It, two and a half days, two and a half days back, and you felt like you drank 14 gin and tonics because you couldn't walk a straight line constantly. But we also did some incredible things. We visited penguin colonies, we did a glacier climb, and we even kayaked through iceberg fields. Just an incredible experience. The preparation for running a race like Antarctica is difficult. You don't know what you're going to get, but you know it's going to be cold. Luckily, I'm from Michigan, right? So the people I ran with that were from Texas and Puerto Rico, they struggled. They couldn't believe how cold it was. I ran part of it without gloves because I was warm. <laughs> you know, I'm used to it. Runners are in tune with their bodies. We track our heart rate, we track um, our temperature, our sugar levels, how we feel, how we digest. We put a lot into managing our bodies so that we can perform. That race was tough. Some people didn't finish. During the last 10 miles, I actually stopped and walked a few times. I was really struggling. When I got home, my health declined. I didn't feel right. I listened to my body and I went to my doctor. The doctor said I was burned out. The doctor said I was overtraining. He, uh, he sent me to some specialists at my urging. I went to an asthma specialist because I couldn't breathe right. I went to a pulmonary specialist. Maybe it was my lungs. And finally, I told him I need to go to a cardiologist. He laughed at me. You're a marathon runner. In fact, I'd run marathons with my doctor and beat him. Okay, And he's like, there's no way it's your heart. I visited a cardiologist, and he quickly discovered that I had a 95% blockage in my LAD artery. For those of you who don't know what the LAD artery is, that's the one they refer to as the Widowmaker. Quickly, I had an angioplasty and a stent put in. I was fortunate I didn't have a heart attack because I listened to my body, I knew what I was experiencing, and I knew it wasn't right. If it hadn't been for my running, and if it hadn't been for my experience in Antarctica, there's a good chance I would not have known that I had a problem. And I didn't have a heart problem, I had an artery problem. There's a very good chance 
that I would have passed away at some point in time if I had pushed that race too hard. On that ship, it was a Russian research vessel. There was a volunteer doctor who answered an online ad saying, do you want a free trip to Antarctica? Okay. All of the medical books and all of the medications in the Russian sick bay were written in Russian, and she was from Canada. There's no, there's no way she could have done a bypass. So fast forward a year later, change, right? I'm a different person. Three weeks ago, my baby brother, he's 45 years old, uh, had, a, had a heart attack. He didn't see it coming. He wasn't as active as I am. He spent time in the hospital. Luckily, he survived. But that's the difference. Right? Listening to your body, knowing how you feel, keeping track of it, and just going about your life and living it and not really thinking about your health and pursuing uh, a better lifestyle. Listen to your body. No one else can hear it. Now I've changed. I spent the first 50 years of my life building a resume. The rest of my life, I like to think that I'm writing a eulogy. How do you impact change? How do you change other people? A few weeks ago, a friend of mine, Bill Wappler, who I work with, and you'll hear from tomorrow, asked me what I wanted out of life. I said, well, I've, I've always wanted to do remarkable things. I want to be part of remarkable things. I want to encourage others. I want to continue to mentor students. I want to push myself so I can be here and share life lessons and make a difference in other people's lives. And I think that's a good goal for everybody is to look at how you can help other people, because that's truly satisfying. In four weeks, I'll be running the Marine Corps Marathon and testing out the stent for the first time. I think I'm ready. I'm not in as good shape as I once was when I was running 338s, but I'm sure I can squeeze out a fairly good time and enjoy myself. But remember, with or without you, they're going to build cars tomorrow. You want to be here to see those cars produced, even if they don't need you to drive them. So listen to your body, take care of your health, because you want to be part of all these wonderful changes for both yourself and your family. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, what a great kind of a story there, uh, and for sure the, the life lessons that you learned from from each, uh, each marathon and each continent is something that uh, we can all uh, reflect on. So a fantastic opener uh, to the conference there. A couple of things that I kind of that rung true to me as well. You know, you're saying the message that your, your mother put up in your first marathon saying, go Mike, uh, whenever I go home after a long business trip, I walk home and there'll be a sign at the door saying, go Louis. So, <laughs> The other thing is what you said about listening to your body. So important. So important for your health. Trouble is, my body keeps saying to me, I'm hungry. So. And I've got to say, I think I, you know, I, was, I was a bit disappointed. I actually thought it was seven marathons in seven continents in seven days. So I think, yeah, you know, big deal, seven continents. You know. <laughs> Uh, but no, truly a great uh, inspirational uh, kind of story there. Uh, the next presentation, we'll be looking at how our industry, back to, automo back to the automotive and logistics industries, uh, you know, looking forward, how are things going to change, what's going to happen, you know, forecast sales globally, uh, and how uh, our industry uh, or maybe, you know, different sectors are going to be affecting our industry uh, in a big way. Uh, someone, you know, the sevens also come into play there. Uh, someone who's famous for eating seven burgers in seven hours for seven days. Um, I'd like to welcome to the podium Brandon Mason, Automotive Director and Mobility Leader for PwC. Thank you, Brandon. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let's give it up for Mike one more time. That was a great presentation.
So my job is sort of to kick off the, the outlook part of the, of the conference, give you some stuff to talk about for the next few days. And, and obviously, as, as is usually the case in our industry, there's always plenty to discuss. So I'll kick it off, and we'll talk about our, our global outlook at PwC uh, in terms of assembly. Some of you may have seen uh, this chart before. Uh, this breaks down our automotive assembly forecast between mature and emerging markets, and that's 2016 versus 2023. What you see there is that a large majority of that growth is coming from emerging markets, which is something that over the last several years I've tried to hammer home that while there is still opportunity in a lot of these mature markets, um, the volume growth is really coming from those emerging markets, so much so that 94% of that growth that we're forecasting, that's about 19 or 20 million units over the next six or seven years, is coming from those emerging markets. Uh, if you look at the top six countries in terms of assembly growth, those are listed there on the bottom. China continues to dominate the landscape, um, 8 million units of growth between now and 2023. We've got that market hitting around 35 million units uh, by 2023, just vast, vast growth there. And a lot of that is driven actually by the domestic OEMs as they continue to increase their capabilities um, and gain share in the marketplace there. Second is India. Uh, you know, India continues to be a, a net export uh, market in terms of their sales versus assembly footprint. Uh, India, it's, it's interesting to note, I mean, will actually surpass China in terms of the, the, their population. They'll be the most populous country in the world uh, here in the next 15 years or so. Um, but they are dwarfed by China in terms of their automotive assembly footprint. So even with that growth, India is only forecasted to hit around 6.7 million units by 2023. Next on that list is Thailand. Thailand, as you know, is, is famous for their pickup production and is an export hub for, for ASEAN and the rest of that region. Then we have Russia. Russia is mainly recovery volume, as we've seen that market decline precipitously over the last three or four years. Um, so some of that volume that we're showing in growth is actually just recovery volume from previous highs. And then Mexico and the US, which we'll get into um, in a few minutes here, but of note, the US we've got there is the number six uh, growth market. What we don't have included, because this is from our Q3 forecast release, was the, the recently announced Toyota Mazda joint venture plant here in the United States. So if you add another 300,000 units to that, that actually catapults the U.S. all the way up to, to number three in the world. So for all the concern about, you know, where is assembly going within the region, uh, sales fluctuations, things like that, the assembly outlook for the U.S. and actually the region is, is quite strong. So something we'll certainly keep an eye on. Next, as is always a hot topic these days, and I'll get into this more in a few minutes, what is our alternative propulsion outlook? So this is everything from hybrids, plug-in, electric, and fuel cell vehicles. And again, this is our, our global outlook. And a few things are driving our top line. Um, as you know, in, in Europe and in Asia, it's mainly driven by the regulatory environment. We've seen several announcements over the last few months come out that uh, the UK and Germany and other markets in Europe are going to ban the sales of combustion engine vehicles here by, it's anywhere from 2030 to 2040, depending on the market. That's a significant development, if you think about it, right? So this is not saying we're gonna give consumers a choice or automakers, yes, we have increasingly stringent emission standards that you have to hit. It's up to you how you meet those standards. This is, you are not selling combustion engine vehicles. You will sell only electric or fuel cell. Uh, technology vehicles. So that's really driving our European top line up. Um, even in China, which is, again, as I mentioned, is the world's largest automotive market, uh, they're starting to come around as it relates to emission standards and are playing around with their own policies related to banning the sales of, of combustion engine vehicles. And again, if you look at our outlook, right, 35 million units by 2023, who knows what it's going to be 2030, 2040 as that market continues to grow. You're talking a significant shift uh, and production capabilities within that market. The one, the one market where we're kind of contrary to the rest of the world is the one, the one that we're sitting in today, right? We're, we're not only are we talking about, you know, a freezing or a pause of the, of the um, fuel efficiency and emission standards, there's a possibility we could roll them back, right? Because in the market today with, with low oil prices, and we've all seen where demand stands for large pickups and SUVs and crossovers, Consumer demand is not dictating that we go and get more efficient as an industry. So absent a strong regulatory environment, uh, the U.S. will probably lag uh, the rest of the world as it relates to uh, market share of those alternative propulsion vehicles. As it stands today, the U.S. is only about 3% in 
And that includes you know, traditional hybrid vehicles um, along with the plug-in electric and, and fuel cell. So it's a bit of a mixed bag as we look around the world. Um, so certainly um, we'll have to see what, uh, what develops here over the coming years and decades as it relates to policy in the US and as, as well as around the world. All right, so I wanted to talk a minute uh, about the impacts of, of the hurricanes that we've seen over the last few months and um, put that in some historical context. It's a question that often gets asked and unfortunately we've been hit by you know, two in the last, in the last two months. So I, I echo Louis sentiments and, and hopefully um, you know, everybody has supported in their own way uh, the recovery efforts uh, in those markets. It's certainly a tough time down there. But I wanted to put this in, in context um, and starting with, with Hurricane Katrina back in 2005 that, that hit New Orleans. And that to date has still been the most expensive uh, hurricane in terms of the cost of recovery. I believe that was around $108 billion uh, worth of damage that was caused to the New Orleans area and the Gulf Coast. Um, but in terms of the number of vehicles lost, it was about 200,000 vehicles uh, that were lost from the market. And that includes so new vehicles you know, sitting on dealer lots as well as vehicles that are out in the park. And so what we did, we wanted to take a look at what was the impact over the following four months of those hurricanes uh, in terms of new vehicle sales and what that did to, to use vehicles from a valuation standpoint. And so in 2005, the four months following Katrina, we actually saw a sales decline of about 4%. So it did not have any sort of significant impact on our new sales top line. So you know, as people file claims, those that have the ability uh, to go in and purchase new vehicles, um, depending on the economic situation and obviously depending on where you're at geographically in the U.S., uh, the, the economics are going to be a little bit different. So new sales actually continued to decline that year. Um, what you did see, the used vehicle value index actually shot up about 7%. So you had a lot of people flocking to used vehicles, probably because they largely couldn't afford those new, those new vehicles, they didn't have insurance, whatever it might be. Um, the the used vehicle market, the inventory was actually kind of low around that time too. So you didn't have a lot of supply to offset that spike in demand. So you, you saw a huge increase in the used vehicle market. Uh, the next one we had was, was 2012 with Sandy. Uh, there were about 250,000 vehicles lost as that went up the East Coast. Uh, the net impact there was an increase in 10% in new vehicle sales. Now, keep in mind there though, right? This was 2012, so we were in the midst of a pretty strong sales resurgence, right? So I think as a, as a whole, the market was up 10 to 12% that year. So that certainly added to that. Um, the used vehicle value index basically was flat. It went up a tenth, of, a tenth of a percent. So there really wasn't a big impact on that. Most of the, those folks got new cars um, or the ownership rate was a little bit less because you had East Coast uh, urban areas, right? So a lot of people were in cities, less ownership, things like that. And then our most recent two here, we had uh, Hurricane Harvey, which hit in August. That was very significant. So keep in mind, they're still tallying up the totals for, for Harvey and, and Irma. But we could have up to a million vehicles lost as a result of Hurricane Harvey. Uh, the Houston area is the fifth largest metropolitan area in the US. There's an extremely high ownership rate of new vehicles there. I think 95% 90, of the population owns vehicles there. And the average household has 1.8 vehicles. So a huge collection of inventory there. So obviously, you know, we would expect a big impact from that. Um, if that were it by itself, we'd see enough, uh, we'd see some spike in, in new vehicle sales as well as demand for used vehicles. But then we had Hurricane Irma uh, that just hit earlier this month. And again, still adding up the totals, but the early estimates are 200 to 400,000 vehicles uh, could be lost as a result of that. So what do we expect to see over the next few months, right? So we've been forecasting a sales decline this year. Um, after seven or eight consecutive years of year-over-year of -year growth. Um, we still expect to see a decline this year, but we will expect to see two or three things happen here from now until the end of the year. Uh, we'll certainly see a spike in new vehicle sales. Uh, we would have seen it in August had Harvey not hit. I think the industry was largely expecting we were gonna see a year-over-year -year increase in August. Uh, we'll continue to see a bump for the rest of the year. We'll see increased incentives, and I'll get to incentives in a minute, but strictly related to targeting those folks that lost vehicles um, to help them accelerate that process and get into a new vehicle. We will also see a temporary spike 
in used vehicle prices, although we expect that to be short-lived as we now have a record number of vehicles coming off lease over the next 12 to 24 months. And the current lease market is somewhere around 30 to 35%, and we've been talking about this for a while, that that bubble was gonna burst at some point when those vehicles started coming back in. Uh, so that will help alleviate some of the price pressures we've, we're, we've been seeing for the used vehicle market. And there's our used vehicle value index. You can see, I mean, it's historically high right now, and that's indexed back to 1995. Um, so we would expect to see you know, a temporary spike in that and then have it start to level off as, as, as those lease vehicles come off. All right, so again, here's our sales outlook. This is historical. Uh, for 2017, the initial forecast this quarter was 16.8 million units. Uh, we could see that exceed 17 million units now, right? Again, be largely driven by the impact of, of the hurricanes. Uh, we'll see what happens. We're overdue for a recession. I've also been talking about that for a while now. You know, that should happen in the next few years. Hopefully, um, you know, we're cautiously optimistic that we're, the industry is better prepared for that. The economic impact won't be nearly as severe as the one that we saw in 2009. Um, so we could see a leveling off of sales, you know, in the 16 to 16 and a half million unit range. Uh, you could see it dip below 16 million units depending on the, the impact of the recession. But certainly something that the industry can weather um, as we're much more uh, prepared for that now as we've built ourselves up around that to be profitable at a much lower level. Inventory. So right now our inventory stands at just below 4 million units. Again, this is U.S. US inventory. Uh, we were concerned a few months back because inventory had actually eclipsed the 4 million unit mark, um, which was a little scary because I'm not sure that we've ever done that um, in our history. And when you start to do that, incentives start to creep up, right? Subvented financing starts to increase, more rental car fleet uh, sales happen, um, and you start to push vehicles on the industry as opposed to aligning it with natural demand. Uh, to the credit of the industry, we've seen shift reductions, we've seen uh, plant closures, plant downtime. Um, you know, we've, I think we've got a strike going on in Canada right now, which um, could further impact inventory. Um, the industry is attempting to rectify that, and obviously, again, with the impacts of the hurricanes, uh, we would expect inventory to, to creep back down that day supply number will likely decrease as well. So I think we're sort of away from the cliff right now as it relates to inventory issues, but something obviously we keep a close eye on. The next piece is incentives, and right now the industry stands at around $3,700, give or take. Again, in the near term, we would expect inventory, or excuse me, incentives to creep up, again, to, to help with sales of those vehicles uh, for folks that were affected by the hurricanes. Um, incentives are now over 10% of average transaction price. So that's another sort of red flag that we like to wave that says, hey, that's a pretty big chunk of change, right? Um, if you look at the breakdown further of this, it's concerning because passenger car incentives are actually higher than light truck. And think about that from a transaction price. What's the average transaction price of a pickup SUV versus the average transaction price of a passenger car? They're markedly different, right? So if you look at the average transaction price uh, of a passenger car and then look at the incentives that are on it, it's pretty alarming, right? Because the demand for those products are simply lukewarm in this market right now. As long as fuel prices stay low and there's an, a ton of new uh, products being offered in the pickup light truck uh, segment, that's gonna continue to, to wane. So inventory, if you look at passenger cars, it's, it's roughly aligned to, to what demand is. I think it's about 38% versus 62% for light truck. So again, Want to be careful that we don't uh, over incentivize too much, or else uh, when we try and pare those down, customers get a little bit a little bit finicky. They're like, "Hey, where's my where's my money? Where's my incentives? What's what's the deal? I thought you were going to throw money at me." So again, something to keep an eye on. All right, let's pivot now to to assembly, and so this is our light vehicle assembly outlook by market uh, in North America. So we've got U.S., Canada, and Mexico, and the story in the U.S. is is pretty solid. Um, Last year, we were at 11.8 million units. Again, if you throw in the Toyota Mazda plant that's supposed to open, I believe, in 2021, uh, by the end of our forecast window, you're at 13 million units of assembly for, for the U.S. Um, Canada is sort of the outlier in the market, so you've got a combination of, of plant closures and product shifts to either the U.S. or Mexico, uh, which is actually declining that top line down to, I think it's about 1.9 million units by the end of our forecast window. And then Mexico, and the Mexico outlook actually you know, these are announced plants. So we don't have any speculative plants in Mexico as we used to because a lot of those have come to fruition or have, have been announced. Um, there's a possibility that that number could tick upwards even further if you think about potential Chinese 
OEMs localizing capacity uh, in that market. Um, I know we've got Elza Ponta, who's presenting later in the conference, and, and Al and I were on a panel together um, last month in Baltimore. And uh, Al, you're in for a treat with Al. He's got a lot of good insights around, around NAFTA and the potential impacts of that. So um, I'll leave it to, to Al to, to talk about that. But I do want to talk briefly about um, the import-export outlook for, for the U.S. And so what this slide represents is light vehicle imports to the U.S. by country. So last year, we imported over 8 million uh, vehicles into the United States. Roughly half of that came from U.S. and Canada. They each had about 2 million, 2 million vehicles each. The rest came from uh, Japan, Germany, South Korea to make that up. But you can see it's, it's on the rise. All right? uh, the flip side of that is the U.S. is actually continuing to export more product. Last year, we exported about 2 million units. Um, those largely went to, to Europe and, and some Asian countries. Um, so we're continuing to increase our exports as well. So obviously the dynamic there, it's, I don't want to say it's teetering, but it's certainly up in the air as it relates to what the end impact of NAFTA ends up being, right? Whether we continue to have free trade across US, Canada, Mexico, whether our import tariffs imposed. Um, for now, we don't see a significant shift in policy, but again, we will, we will have to wait and see on that. Um, but we do expect to see, regardless of the outcome, more localization particularly from South Korean and Japanese OEMs um, in terms of their capacity. So you couldn't see imports tick down a little bit. Likewise, on the export side, we expect to see further export increase uh, from the US to markets abroad. And so at the end of the day, we'll still be a net importer of products, but we do expect that gap to close a little bit. All right, and so if you take a look at our light vehicle assembly top line for North America, this is, this is where it stands. So again, despite any sales fluctuations or concerns about NAFTA, uh, we do see strong growth within the region. So leveling out somewhere between you know, 19 and 20 million units. 20 million units is certainly a possibility by the end of our forecast window um, if everything sort of falls into place. So if you're, a, if you're an OEM or a supplier within the region, I'd say you know, you're, you're in pretty good shape for at least the, uh, the next several years. Don't hold me to that, though. All right, I want to pivot a little bit and now talk um, with the rest of my time this morning to talk a little bit about mobility and specifically smart cities and some of the things that, that Michigan, since we're in, in Detroit, that, uh, that Michigan and the city of Detroit uh, have undertaken to increase uh, and promote mobility around the world. So in summary, you know, if we think about mobility, the freedom of mobility, the ability to move from point A to point B is, is being threatened, right? Huge population growth, one of the big trends that we see are people moving back into cities and city centers. It's becoming much more congested, right? So it's not just about having clean cars or efficient vehicles. It's about how do we more intelligently move from place to place, right? And those aren't necessarily just by, by cars. That's multiple modes of transit. That's multiple business models around mobility as it relates to ride sharing, um, autonomous car sharing, things like that. Um, there's a lot of different solutions that really need to come to fruition to make mobility a reality. There's new models being tested every day. Uh, we see it in the, in the news around, um, you've got new car sharing models, new, new ride sharing models, um, mass transit options, smart cities, uh, use of sensors and things like that. So things are happening today. The disruption that we anticipate happening in the industry down the road in terms of the market share, all that investment and all that research and development is happening today, and it's something that the folks in this room shouldn't avoid. Um, it should definitely be embraced. So when we talk about mobility, here's just a quick look as the way, at the way that we define our ecosystem of mobility. There are eight modules um, in the world of mobility, in our mobility ecosystem, as, as we like to call it. And I'll just quickly run through them. We've got connected, the sales, finance, and insurance piece of that. So how are those vehicles delivered? How, the, how are they financed? Uh, the insurance industry, obviously, is one that's that's uh, subject to potential massive disruption uh, if, if things come to fruition around autonomous and connected and, and accidents decrease significantly. So that's something to keep an eye on. Uh, the digital piece of that, so this is, you know, this is apps, um, this is cybersecurity, things like that, blockchain that are really gonna help define our industry for the next 10 or 20 years. Mass transit, I mentioned that already, you know, so it's not just, um, it's not just vehicles, it's, it's it's uh, city buses, it's microtransit, it's ride sharing, it's uh, you know, the people mover, it's, 
It's all of those things uh, combined into one. The regulatory environment is another huge driver, obviously, uh, trying to find some common ground around that to speed up development of some of those different mobility models. And then autonomous and shared mobility. So again, just briefly, that is how we see mobility. And we like to f think that everything fits nicely into a bucket, but it doesn't, right? So when I was saying a couple years, this ecosystem will likely look different than the way it does today just because of all the disruption taking place. So a quick look at our, this is our outlook. This is actually from our strategy and team that just last week released um, our digital auto uh, report. And so this provides our outlook out to 2030 for three different distinct types of technology. We've got electric vehicles, connected and autonomous. And so this is for the US, the EU, and China. So it's got it by year. The first one is uh, electric vehicles, and we've got a, a mix of combustion, hybrid, and electric. And as I mentioned before, that's largely driven by the regulatory environment, particularly in the EU uh, in China. And so by 2030, which is the far right bar there, you can see that 34 million units of the roughly 80 million units that are going to be sold in those markets uh, will be hybrid. 44 million, over 50 percent, will be electric. And that's a huge ramp up from where we see it today. If you, if you recall the, the projection we had for 2023, globally it's like 11 or 12 percent. We knew it would be elevated in, in Europe, but that's a massive jump if you think about it from 2023 to 20, 2030. So there's a lot of disruption that's going to happen between now and then. The second chart, this is connected cars, and this really shouldn't be a big surprise, right? So everybody in this room more or less has a connected car today, right? I mean, you've got, you've got infotainment systems. You've got an OnStar, some sort of device there. Your phone can connect to your car. Uh, you've got traffic reports, things like that. So really, that's not a, a shocking thing, but we live in a mature market, right? What, what's interesting is even by 2030, China, who has a lot of developing aspects uh, within that market, those vehicles will all be connected as well. And the last one is sort of like the holy grail, right? We always say connected is sort of the roadway to fully autonomous vehicles. And so this is split out by the level of autonomy. So remember a quick lesson here. So autonomy is zero to five, right? Zero is you know, your classic 1967, whatever, you know, that, that doesn't really have anything except for maybe air conditioning, AM, FM radio. Uh, there still are some cars today that are not technically uh, autonomous or have any sort of advanced driver assistance system, but level one has one piece of ADAS technology, uh, advanced driver assistance system. So that could be you know, rear parking assist, lane departure warning, something like that. Level two has multiple ADAS systems. Level three is partially autonomous, which means that under certain conditions, the vehicle can drive itself, but the driver still needs to be aware and engaged and have their hands on the steering wheel. Level four is uh, more or less fully autonomous, right? So in, in basically any condition, the driver does not need to be engaged, does not need their hands on the wheel. And level five is sort of, again, sort of like the holy grail, right, as we think about autonomy. That's where you started to get into, do you even need a steering wheel? The driver can kind of take a nap, kick back. Uh, and that opens a whole new opportunity if you think about the design of interiors for those vehicles, um, the, the design, the, the, uh, the different efficiencies that can be gained from somebody just kind of hopping in a vehicle and forgetting about it, right? Similar to, you know, if anybody takes the train or a bus or anything like that, you just, you kind of zone out. You're not even worried about the environment around you. So that's a brief look at our outlook for those technologies. Uh, I want to shift now to smart cities and just talk for a minute about smart cities. So, you know, what makes a smart city? So there's, there's not like a set checklist, right? I mean, the jury kind of still out in terms of the different components that make up a smart city. But four that we see is sort of crucial to that are infrastructure. So, you know, not just the roads, the highways, but, you know, the parking decks, the, the signs, uh, the charging stations, et cetera, all of that bring, that comes into that ecosystem, um, are those enabled for smart technology? The second is having multiple transit options, as I mentioned before, that you can't just have one, you can't just have a train or a bus system. It's a combination of those things working together. R&D and investment, so whether that's in the city or in a, in a surrounding area, to have significant R&D and investment capabilities within your area is obviously a huge plus. And then sort of the overriding thing there is, is health, safety, and security of its citizens, right? So to test vehicles, we have to make sure that those are safe to consumers and that we're not putting any lives or well-being at risk. So I wanted to just call out a couple things um, that, that are happening in Michigan right now. So um, Planet M is sort of the, um, the blanket organization that 
that different entities around the state, public and private interests, have come together on as sort of the umbrella to house the state of Michigan's different mobility initiatives. And I just have a couple listed there. Um, throughout Southeast Michigan, there's DSRC deployments. Uh, that's direct short-range communication devices for vehicle-to-vehicle, -vehicle, vehicle infrastructure. Uh, we have the Smart Corridor in Southeast Michigan. Again, that's, that's roughly 120 miles of roadways that are, that are wired for smart technology to collect data, again, V2V, V2I. There's the Truck Platooning Initiative with TARDEC, which is over in Warren next to the GM Tech Center. Uh, that is autonomous trucking, so you've got one truck that's sort of leading, leading the rest along the way. Uh, you've got a smart fleet that the Michigan Department of Transportation is using. Uh, you've got traffic operation centers. But the end game here is all about data collection, right? It's all about data analytics and studying that data to try and make your software and your hardware smarter. And so there's a huge data collection initiative going on right now within the state, which is really helping to drive innovation. In terms of hubs, there's a couple that are going on right now. Um, Wixom, which was just announced, that's the American Center for Mobility. They're hoping to be up and running with phase one, I believe, by the end of the year. Um, if anybody's familiar with this app, this is the old Wixom plant, which way back when was actually a, a plant that, uh, that Ford started during World War II, I believe, uh, to build airplanes. And most recently, it was a, a transmission center for, for General Motors, where they built transmissions. Um, that's a huge facility. I think it's over 300 acres. And so they're trying to set up a real-time environment to test the different technologies around mobility, as well as have a, you know, an R&D and innovation center right on site there. The second one is, is M-City in Ann Arbor. And again, there are literally dozens of companies that have invested uh, in this facility that are testing out projects there. So M-City is, uh, I think it's about a 32-acre site. And it's supposed to mimic real world conditions, right? So, you know, snow, ice, whatever. What does that, what does that do to roads? What does that do to street signs? Um, what happens when, you know, somebody unexpectedly jumps in the middle of the road? Um, there's a lot of cool things going on there. For, for those of you that live in the area and haven't been there, I highly encourage you to reach out and try and set up a tour because it's a pretty amazing uh, facility and highly encourage you to visit. So really, at, at, in conclusion, I just want to bring up a couple points, right? So we're in sort of this area of shifting from emerging technologies to we, we have an idea of what the world of tomorrow is going to look like. We don't know exactly when we're going to get there, but we know what's happening, right? So as a player today, there's a couple things to keep in mind, and I've got them listed up here. Um, look, immediate investment is needed, right? You can't just stand by and, and wait for you know, the end product to come or else you're going to be out of luck. You're going to be late to the game, right? You're not going to have a, a dance partner. So you need to invest today with the understanding that, that ROI might not happen for quite a ways down the road. Um, it's not fair, but listen, it's, it's worth it in the long term, but you have to make those near-term investments today. As I mentioned before, the trends and technologies that we see today that we're predicting will be the drivers of tomorrow, those could change, right? Uh, it could change wildly. It, that's, that's what's so exciting about this, is that it's all new to so many folks. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow, so we just need to be as versatile as we can to adapt to some of that, those change. So some of those changes. And further collaboration. I can't stress this enough. So people say, how are we going to fund all of this stuff? Well, look, strategic partnerships are an absolute must, right? Whether that's with a competitor, whether that's with a supplier, whether that's with another third-party organization, to work together to share knowledge and resources will only help uh, that change. So those are my comments. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Brandon. Um, again, you know, a great kind of topical insight there from Brandon, which always does so well at our conferences, looking at, you know, potential forecasts. We all know how easy it is to forecast at the moment for the automotive industry. But also looking forward, looking at smart cities, and also updating us on, you know, on even how the effects uh, of storms could possibly affect the automotive industry. So thank you very much for that, that presentation. Also, you talked about data. We'll be covering data in our think tanks later on and also in session four. And it's also good to see Michigan uh, not hiding behind the history but trying to move forward on new mobility at the car makers and as a, and as a state as well. Uh, so now it's time for the Q&A. We haven't got so much time, uh, so I'll give you a chance to ask the first questions. So I'll scrap out the questions I was going to ask about nipple chafing and things like that, uh, Mike. <laughs> so uh, 
If there's uh, any questions from the floor, if anyone wants to say, it's the usual kind of rules. Uh, put your hand up, wait for the microphone, say your name and company name. And of course, you can also ask questions uh, from the app. So I hope you've downloaded the app to take advantage of asking questions or making points or comments and all the other advantages of the, of the app, which is uh, sponsored by Jack Cooper. So a question from in the corner somewhere. So name and company name, please. Uh, hello, Kerry Zielinski from Syncreon. Um, we've all lived through the Betamax and the VHS <laughs> timing where you had to bet on which is the strategy and which thing to put in your home. Are there any organizations that are currently working to try to come up with a standard for the mobility as we move forward? To be fair, I did not live through that, so don't, don't you dare <laughs> put me in that bucket. <laughs> yeah, look, stand, standardization is, the sooner you can get to that, the sooner we can all move forward. I think um, the difficult part is it's hard to say which technology is going to win out because there are pros and cons to each. Um, as it relates to autonomous vehicles, there was some legislation that was passed, I think it was a few weeks ago, it was House Bill 3388, which essentially federalized the, the oversight around testing autonomous vehicles. So while there's different technologies out there, I do think um, a strong regulatory environment to help guide that as opposed to uh, restrict it is a key component of that. Uh, right now, states kind of are on their own as it relates to monitoring autonomous vehicle deployment and testing on the streets and roads. So if that ends up passing the Senate, I think that will be a huge bill. And then obviously organizations like SAE are always huge drivers. You know, if you think about uh, commonizing electric charging plugs, uh, that's a good example of, of trying to get everybody on the same page so we can move forward so you don't have 20 or 30 different electric charging options out there. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's, it's important. And I think you know, the regulatory environment will continue to drive that. But as it relates to some of those technologies, I do think it's a little early to, to tell. Thank you. There's another question there, is there? Alistair, next to you. Yeah. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Llewellyn from Atlas Copco. You did say that there was some um, countries that were banning combustion engines. Do you foresee that the United States would ever take those kind of steps, or will we always be kind of gas dependent? It, it, that's a great question, and you know, I'll tell you honestly, it's it's unclear at this point, right? So uh, we've we've seen the impact when you have differing administrations uh, in the White House, uh, just how marked the change can be. So it's hard to say, you know, who's going to be in office in in 15 or 20 years. Somebody could put out roll out legislation, you know, tomorrow that might not ultimately come to fruition. Um, I, I do think longer term, that seems to be where the rest of the developed world is going. And you know, as leaders uh, within the automotive industry and as a very advanced country, I, I would think at some point the U.S. would have to follow suit. Whether that's in 2030, 2040, 2050, it's hard to say. But the long-term prognosis is at some point combustion engines will go away. Okay. A uh, question at the front here, please. I like that we're making Chris wait. Yeah. <laughs> That's not usually where he slaps me, but uh, <laughs> Christopher Ludwig, Automotive Logistics. See, Louis and I, were, 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 we made unfortunate bets on Betamax about 20 years ago, and so that's why we're, we're still here. Um, I've got two, two quick questions. One, one for Mike, and this, for those of you who weren't in Atlanta, where, where Mike actually presented a bit about um, how company cultures need to kind of change and adjust to... Um, let's say, encourage young people and talent in the industry. If you sort of look at something like what you did with marathons and taking all that time, in today's world, we almost would expect our executives to be checking their email while they're probably running <laughs> in that way. So, I mean, do you think as a, as a kind of business culture, um, we give enough space and room for people to, to do those kinds of things, maybe flexibly, even if it means, you know, I don't know, not being in the office at certain times where we might expect them or even disconnecting a little bit. So just as a kind of general question on that. And then for Brandon, um, with the kind of autonomous technology and changing, do, do, you, do you see a bit of a shakeout in the, the industry in terms of the 
traditional players, um, you know, some of them that may come, go, consolidate, whatever, given the billions that need to be invested in this technology, and, and some of which may well be the Betamax, so to speak, um, uh, in 10, 20 years. So just maybe some general thoughts on that. Well, I'll start by saying it, it depends on the organization, and it depends on the people that you work with. I, I was fortunate that I had a team of people at, where I used to work that could really handle the day-to-day, -day, and I knew that it was all right for me to check out. And usually, you hear about it where people go on cruises, like, well, I had no email. I was on a cruise. Hmm. And, and, uh, and I can tell you, in, uh, in Kenya, there was you know, no wireless. But in Antarctica, we were able to jump onto the Chinese uh, wireless system. And so we, I was able to check. But uh, for the most part, I think that people need that time to check out and do something themselves, whether it's camping or going on an adventure. I think it's, it's a good thing for people because you come back uh, uh, you know, energized. And from a, um, a, a, the perspective of someone that's young, you know, sometimes as we get older, we forget what it's like because now we have so many responsibilities and we've got people that work for us. But, you know, for young people, they really do want to experience the world around them and need that time. And so it's important for, for us as leaders to help them with that and let them take that time so they can have time to grow as a person. And then when they're with us, we can help them grow professionally. So it, we have a responsibility to them. Uh, yeah, as it relates to potential disruption and, and sort of changing of the, the competitive landscape, I think absolutely, Chris. Um, the digital auto study that I referenced, we identify the mobility market as a $2.2 trillion market by 2030. But the takeaway from that is that the percentage of profits from those traditional OEMs and automotive, or and automotive suppliers are going to shrink considerably because there's so many new players coming in. And those are you know, the technology companies that you might think of. Some of the ones probably haven't even been founded yet, right? That in 10 or 20 years will be the next Google or Amazon, you know, the next tech behemoths. And so obviously, as profits shrink and the competitive landscape becomes um, more and more intense, you're going to have to have some consolidation. And there are going to be some folks that, that simply don't make it. So I, I don't think there's any question whether or not it's going to happen. The, the real question is, you know, what's the, what's the pace of change uh, for that? And, uh, and, and how impactful will, will it be as, as it relates to mobility and all the disruptions that are going to happen there? Okay, thank you. There was a question just front middle here. Uh, good morning. I think Mike and Brandon, terrific presentations. Uh, I'm Govin Ranganathan from Next TV, Neo USA. Uh, I think the question was more for Brandon. Uh, Brand. I think you had a slide on mobility, then you talked about infrastructure, then you talked about level of autonomies. Uh, based on uh, your global research, uh, I know some of the level four, level four autonomies are connected to the infrastructure and the pace of infrastructure that we implement, and you had some yearly projections on it. Based on US, Europe, or, e or uh, China, where do you think uh, this level of autonomy will be more advanced? Will it be level four, five more in Europe, in China, or than US, or the other way? Yeah, I, I think Europe for sure, right? Uh, and, and China sort of being the, the wild card there, depending on how quickly um, the regulatory environment will uh, foster that. So if there's a huge push for automation in China, you could see some of the, you know, the tier one, tier two cities start to take that on at a very rapid rate. Um, you know, but Europe, their, their level of adoption for various technologies, whether it's emission or other smart city infrastructure investment, is pretty considerable, right? So I would say Europe would probably lead the way. China has the potential, of, you know, to be number one, but then probably behind the EU, and then, and then the U.S. Would come, would come third. Okay, thank you. Question at the back. Hello, I'm Sarah Liu from General Motors. I would like to ask about the technology innovation in logistic area. Um, the first question is regarding the blockchain you mentioned. Uh, I know that Walmart has started to uh, start the uh, research in blockchain application in food traceability. Uh, how do you think the blockchain could help in automotive logistics? 
So I, I won't admit to be an automotive logistics expert, um, but you know the thing about blockchain is that um, while it was originally intended to, to help with you know financial transactions and things like that to safeguard those, what they, they're finding with blockchain is that there's all sorts of different possibilities as it, rela as it relates to to cybersecurity there. So. Um, you know, I won't get more, much more detail than that. Happy to have a conversation afterwards about it and get in touch with the right folks. But I do think there's, I don't want to say endless possibilities, but if you think about the high priority that's going on right now with cybersecurity, as we've, it was, we've seen over the last couple of weeks especially, um, blockchain has a huge potential um, as it relates to any area, right? So including automotive logistics. Uh, I don't, sorry, just oh, follow up with okay. that. I, I was thinking about like the container traceability, would that be helpful? I think, uh, again, to kind of cover, brand, um, actually maybe if Mike, have you got anything to, to say to that point? Well, just with container traceability, I mean, it offers a large amount of data that is accessible and knowing exactly where material is moving. And, and the the, there's a couple keys to it. Is one is looking at the payback, and and knowing what you have and how you're you're utilizing your assets and the labor it takes to figure out where those assets are at. And I know there's some great displays out there and people talking about that. But there is so much activity. There's so much inbound material that if we can pull that information together and use that information to make better decisions, the payback would be rapid, and and the benefits would be large for the industry. But bringing it all together and getting companies to work together is the key thing behind it. Multiple tier ones, multiple OEMs, and creating that foundation of information. Oh, yeah. Um, I think it's interesting because that's a question I was going to ask. Uh, I was at the uh, Knowledge in Data Discovery Conference, and people were talking about logistics, like the traditional area where the data consolidation is not so good. and. Uh, uh, technology like machine learning or uh, artificial intelligence is not easy to apply in this area because of the data issue. So moving forward, how do you think this industry and like, different players in this industry could work together in terms of like, data mm -hmm. sharing, data consolidation so that we can moving forward um, to a um, more collected or more intelligence like, logistic system? Well, I, th I think that having multiple manufacturers and, and tier companies selecting the platform that they're gonna work with is important. But the thing about the technology is, is that the, there's, there's so much information currently available. You get information from key punching, from barcodes, from RFID that's uh, being implemented. So there's all this information that's available and it is, it's getting into the right system. Now with the cloud technology where the information can be stored, uh, not individually, but collectively, that the, uh, the AI uh, people can, can quickly work on it and come up with uh, information that you can make actionable decisions on. And so it's really an exciting time to be, to be a part of that, because you really have, you've got inbound material and you've got outbound finished vehicles, and there's so much information. It's just, it's, it's ripe, and there is a considerable amount of information available right now. We've been really doing things from a transportation standpoint the same way for 25 years, and that's barcodes and paperwork. And, and so now we're really ready to move beyond that and utilize that information and other new information to make better decisions and faster decisions. And I'll, I'll add to that and just say, I mean, I, I know there's a whole host of, of new platforms that are available out there to, to, to gather data, analyze data. I think another key is you know, the folks in this room, the willingness to share data uh, with one another, because um, again, as I said in my comments, that'll help drive innovation, that'll help drive efficiency. So I know you know, data management and the sharing of data is always a sensitive topic, but um, the willingness to, to be more open about that and more transparent, I think, will help accelerate things as well. Yeah. Okay, thank Great. you. And we'll be covering these, these areas, the data and blockchain, in the think tanks after lunch, in session four, and blockchain probably more in, in session five tomorrow morning. So they're very good and pertinent questions, but they'll be covered more uh, in the, this afternoon and, and tomorrow morning. So uh, I, think the, I think that was, a, I think it was a, a great start to the conference, a great first session. Uh, one, of the, one of the ways you can use the app uh, is if you can give us your opinion on the, 
uh, on the first session. Please let us know if you think it's uh, been useful, interesting. Uh, so please, if you can use the voting, uh, go to the voting part of the app, and it gives you uh, the opportunity to, to, rate the, to rate the session. And of course, if we get completely uh, low marks, then the ejector seats will actually start working <laughs> on the stage. Um, I'd also like to invite uh, Hayden Smith from Syncreon, uh, just to say he's the Syncreon of the host of the coffee break. So I just wanted to give uh, Hayden a chance just to say a few words. Sure. Thank you, Louis. Thank you, gentlemen. What a great start to a great conference, and we certainly look forward to it. Um, we, the group in the room today certainly won't be running seven marathons in seven <laughs> continents. However, we do have a two-day marathon of meetings and, and exciting stuff. So Synchron would like to invite you, obviously, to, to have a coffee to help you get through those two days, maybe an extra support during the two days. Um, <laughs> So uh, please have a coffee on us throughout the conference and come by and say hello to us uh, at, at our booth. So thanks, Louis. Thank Cheers. you, Hayden. Thank you. <laughs> and of course, thank you to, to our two speakers uh, for, for starting off the conference in a great way. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you. Well done. Thank you.